college student was in a philosophy class which had a discussion about God's existence. The professor presented the following logic. Has anyone in class heard God? Nobody spoke. Has anyone in this class touched God? Again, nobody spoke. Has anyone in class seen God? When nobody spoke for the third time, he simply stated, then there is no God. One Christian student thought for a second and then, then asked for permission to reply. Curious to hear this bold student's response, the professor granted it, and the student stood up and asked the following questions of his classmates. Has anyone in class heard our professor's brain? Silence. Has anyone in class touched our professor's brain? Absolute silence. Has anyone in class seen our professor's brain? When nobody in class dared to speak, the student concluded that according to our professor's logic, it must be true that our professor has no brain. Ooh. The student sat back down and he received an A-plus in the class. <laughs> Amen to that, right? <laughs> that said that was an inspirational story, but I found that more funny than inspirational. <laughs> it's, anyways, so last week, we've been, we've been doing this two-week series here on two sons and the father. Right? And last week we talked about the younger son, the prodigal son, and how he was impatient, requested his inheritance early, and before, uh, before even his father was even of ill health at this point, he was still healthy and everything, which was unheard of you know, at this time, because he, he really truly didn't care at the time about his father. And he lived it up, and he blew all the money, and he became lost, is what we said. And he took a job feeding pigs with a Jewish man who would, you know, which would be embarrassing for a Jewish person, especially at, you know, at this culture at this time, um, because pigs were considered unclean. And he was even considering trying to eat with the pigs. When uh, we then, you know, he, we see him, he gets desperate and he gets broken in this time. Like many of us have been there at that point in time. A lot of times God really, really shows up big in our lives, right, when we're desperate and broken. And then we see the beautiful redemption of the younger son, right? And we see this through him admitting his mistakes, and we see this through him admitting his sins and truthfully asking for forgiveness. And we see how the father, in this sense, is overjoyed, and he runs after him and is celebrating the return of his son, the one that was lost. See, the father in this story, as we know, is a representation of God and rejoices at the return of his once dead, but now alive, son, and throws a party. And we, I talked about how this kind of relates to society right now, how we are just praying that our society, which was once close to God, seems to be pulling away. We want it to come back. We want to, it, to, it to run towards God. And now, in the story, we're going to pick up concerning the older brother. The older brother, a very much different outlook from this story and his relationship with the father. We're going to pick up at verse 22, and this is Luke 15. Um, it says, But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. And he's talking about the younger son still here. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fat and calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of those servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered, he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours was, who was, has squandered your property and prostitutes comes home, uh, you, you killed a fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had, we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He lost and his, he was lost, and now he is found. So, we see a much different part of this story, right? 
we see the older brother, and he's acting way different than anybody else that we've discussed so far. And I mentioned how last week, this whole entire section of Luke 15 is concerning God's viewpoint with sinners, um, and how he treats sinners and the, those things. And Jesus is telling these parables. He starts off with the lost sheep and the lost coin, and then and now we get to the lost son, the, the, the prodigal son. But let's look back at what begins Luke 15 from the very beginning. And the scripture says, now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So this is when Jesus decides to go into these parables. And Jesus is hanging out with tax collectors and sinners. Now, if we go off topic just a little bit, how bad do people look at tax collectors? That always amazes me, because it's always, oh, he's with tax collectors and sinners. You know, it's always the tax collectors it seems like they're most disgusted with at all times. Um, but the these, these Pharisees and Sadducees are upset because Jesus is hanging out with unrighteous people, right? Dirty people, as they would consider them. And... Who else that the Pharisees are actually the ones technically being sinful in these moments, right? Um, Charles Spurgeon wrote, and I read something from him last week, but concerning this Luke 15, he says, Who loves a bag of old nails or a sack of sawdust? And yet some men and women are almost as hard and dry. If you want to draw people around you, you must have sympathy with them. That's important. If you want to draw people around you, you must have sympathy with them. Compassion magnetizes a man and makes him attract as the lodestone fascinates the needle. A big heart is one of the main essentials to great usefulness. Try and cultivate it. Do not let another man's sorrow fall dead on a deaf ear as, you far, as, as far as you are concerned. But have sorrow with the sorrowful and have compassion upon the ignorant and those that are out of the way. They will soon perceive it, and they will do to you as they did to your master, of whom we read, all the tax collectors and the sinners were drawing near to him. So we know, and we've heard in the Bible, that Jesus was there for the sick, right? As a doctor, you don't go to the doctor because of being well. You go to the doctor being sick, and the doctor helps you. God teaches us to be loving, and he teaches us to bring comfort and be merciful because he is all these things. And these things are what we are all created in his image. So our relationship with other people, sin or not sinful, is to be these things. That doesn't mean, again, that we tolerate the sin, but in, indeed we must be loving, comforting, and also merciful. Right here in this story, we have some unknowing, or say, I can say ignorant Pharisees judging God. The Pharisees don't even know, but they're right there. They are placing hate and judgment on God himself in the flesh. And do not, you know, the parable of the prodigal son is actually being told, not so much, even though it is being told to, for the, the younger son's perspective of those being lost, but the parable of the prodigal son is actually talking about a, another prodigal, and that's the older brother. This self-righteous older brother who is completely lost in his self-righteousness. Do not miss this point, because when we study and when people talk about the prodigal son, you always get caught up in the younger son's story, and that's great. Because a lot of us do fall before we get up. But how about the guy that didn't fall? How about the guy that kind of had it going the whole life, but yet he's still far away from God? Most likely, we, we most have stories probably that follow along with the prodigal son himself, the younger son, because we've all, you know, had our downfalls in this world. Um, we're young at one point, we're unwise, and we're a little bit wild, some of us, well, at least me. I don't know, I don't want to speak for everybody. Um, but what about the self-righteous? What about the person that doesn't think they've done anything wrong? Maybe they haven't done anything societally wrong, right? But are they right in God's eyes? The older brother, like the Pharisees, he became angry. When the father rejoices in the repentance 
in return of his lost son. They get, he gets angry. Like the Pharisees, he refuses to associate himself or even be around his younger brother in this moment of joy because he looks down upon him. He basically doesn't even see him as a human anymore. He worked with pigs. After the father pleads for him to come celebrate with him, he starts speaking like he was owed. Remember last week I talked about people thinking they're owed something. He talks like he is owed for the actions that he's done all year. I've been with you, Dad, the whole time. I've worked with you the whole time. I've always been there and done all the right things. You owe me. That's not how this works. That's not what God teaches us. God owes us nothing. We sinned, not God. We became lost, not God. We fall short, not God. It's his grace that saves us and nothing anything we can do to earn that. It's important to know that it's nothing we do, but only God in us that makes us do the things we do that are righteous in his kingdom. Amen. And it says, but he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so that I could go celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, when this son of yours, look how he's talking to his dad, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. And the fattened calf must have been really valuable, that's all I can say about that, because they use that all the time. Just like the Pharisees, the older brother feels like he is above everyone else and free of all sin. He is clean and they are dirty. He says, this son of yours, the older son has completely disowned his brother. He has wiped his hands free of what he considers to be someone who is actually, a, to him, dead. And he's scorning the very person who has been with him from the very beginning, right? Because we know that the Father we're talking about is God. And God created him, and he's been there from day one. Before day one, we lost. But what does the Father do? Does the Father turn and just don't talk to him anymore? Does the Father give up on him? No. We know that God doesn't give up. And he, he doesn't yell back at him, and he doesn't scorn him for what he said. No, he does none of these things, because that's not God. That's not God's nature. He says, my son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. He professes his love for his son, just like God continues to love us when we are far away and when we are actually right beside him the whole time. God has given us everything. When we look back at this famous verse, John 3.16, we all know it, right? And if we keep reading past John 3.16, John 3.17 and 18 actually really tie it in really well, too. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world. He did not send his Son to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. Amen to that. The father loves his children. I repeat, the father loves his children. The next time you see a lost person or somebody that tells you that God does not seem to care about them, tell them how much he loves them. Tell them how much he cares and what he did for them and what he's done for you. So much that he puts himself on a sacrificial cross so that what we have done is paid for in full. So much that even when we give up on him, and we do at times give up on God, he continues to pursue us in hopes that we will believe in the name of Jesus Christ. So much love that he created us in his image. We can't look past that. We are an image of God. We are created in his image. And that's whether it's relations, physical look, and other anything that we're in God's image on how we're supposed to present ourselves in life. 
So we have opportunities for relationship with him who created the entire world. I want to leave you with this. These key points through this whole prodigal son thing. It's not just one son, like we said, it's two. But focus in on the father and how he reacts to those that are lost around him. The younger son made a choice. He chose to live terribly, but later chose to ask for forgiveness and come back to the father. The older son made a choice. He chose to scorn his father and not embrace the return of his younger brother. In your prayers, Ask God to open your eyes to the choices you make in life and make sure that you end yours with the choice to ask for forgiveness and come back to the Father. And don't scorn God. God chose to give his creation the, the gift of free will. You've heard of free will before. The free will to choose, right? Why did he do that? Do you often wonder, and I have kids ask me this all the time, but I've actually had adults have asked me this before. Well, if God wanted us all to be loving and happy and everything, why don't we just all be made just like God and we can't sin and all this? Did you ever think about that? I thought about it. Why? Wouldn't it seem easier if there's nobody sin and we all just prance around and everything's great? No. This doesn't work that way. And why? It's because without the option to choose, there is no ability to love. What is love without your ability to choose God? Otherwise, you're just a robot. Right? So I urge you to always choose God in all things you do. So that you know and always have in you the ability to love. God today, go today and tell those that are around you that you love them. That you, uh, that you love them, and if you have a strained relationship with somebody, you know, if there's anybody out there you know is struggling, tell them how much you love them and how much God loves them and how much you're thinking about them and praying for them. I've never been turned down by somebody saying, you know, no, don't pray for me. Always pray for them, even if they're not of our faith. Still offer prayer to them. Show them that love. And tell them no matter what, you still love them. Don't ever give up. No matter how hard it is, you never give up because he will never give up on you. Please stand with me.